lives to the community in terms of highlighting some of the marginalized communities. Yeah. Well, and not only that, but I think um, in terms of what you're talking about with sustainability and, you know, using materials, etc., everything that this, um, they did a tremendous fundraising effort to create this sculpture. And, um, well, before I get into that, um, i got to get my mind organized. They did a tremendous fundraising effort, and they raised an incredible amount of money to, to make this because a, a monumental sculpture this size with lighting and the you know the surround and the landscaping and everything it's it's astronomical right but as we were putting and I think this is somebody maybe from your class as we were putting um, the materials in because of the subject because of the marginalized population because of Abe Landau, for whom this whole thing is about, and I'll talk about him. Because of all of this, most of the material became donated. So underneath this circle is about um, four tons of concrete. And they brought it in, and it goes down really deep because of the weight and gravity over time. You don't want a huge monument like this sinking into the ground. So. Um, when the dump trucks were coming in to fill the hole, they just drove away and said, you don't owe us any money. When Rex Monuments came and, and created these tablets, we got the tablets um, in Vermont, but when Rex Monuments came and did all this, they said, we're giving that to you. The bricklayer who laid all these bricks is a very, um, he's an amazing artisan from Portugal. He has done all the stonework, I think, in the last 20, 25 years in New Bedford. He is an absolute incredible artist. And the city of New Bedford donated his time to do all this. I mean, it's just incredible. So at the end, I've never ever heard of this happening or seen it happen, but at the end of the whole project, they had about half their budget still in the coffers. And they took that and they made an education fund. And for, since this has been up for 15 years, they've gone to schools far and wide um, educating young people about the Holocaust. Isn't that amazing? That's wonderful. So it's, you know. And then, I mean, I worked with. Okay. <laughs> so I'll, I'll talk, I'll, should I pause and wait or? Oh, well, they'll miss some of it. I'll, I'll talk. <laughs> <laughs> the other thing is, so, um, Rick, Eric, and I were consulted to create this monument by Peter London, who is an art history professor. Did you ever meet Peter London? I don't think so. He's an amazing visionary, and he has several books, um, No More Secondhand Art is One, and he's just a fantastic visionary, and he's part of the um, Jewish community in the area, and he's part of the synagogue that's down the street. And he started working with Abe Landau um, to create a monument representing the Holocaust. So when he came to the sculpture department, he wanted, he had this, he had this drawn almost exactly like this, but he had no idea how to make it. He envisioned it, but he didn't know how to make it. So he came to us to ask us advice. And I had just started, I mean, I was probably on campus three weeks right out of grad school. And I got involved. And then, of course, you know, Rick, Eric, and I didn't charge them to do anything either. So everything, this monument was really born out of the love for this man, Abe Lando. So his story is, um, Abe was a Holocaust survivor. And... He's an amazing man. He actually lived over in that um, neighborhood right over there. And do you know any of this, um, Pamela? Do you know any of this history about Abe Landau or anything? A bit you. Okay. It's amazing because um, so Abe was a Holocaust survivor, and the only reason he survived is a French doctor saw him. He was 12 years old. He was in the Holocaust for five years 
and traveled to tra different concentration camps between 12 and 17. And this French doctor found him, liked him for whatever reason, and would take him as his assistant. And then the Nazis would take Abe away. And then this French doctor would find him. And he went all over um, with this doctor. And it's the only reason he says he was alive. So when this plinth was being delivered, this huge crane was coming down. I stood right where you guys are with Abe Landau. And he said, I was at Buna, Dora, Nisko, Danzig, Dachau. I mean, I think he was in, my memory might be failing me, but he was in like 13 or 15 concentration camps in five years. So, and then if you notice at the very bottom where the last one that they list is sort of half typed, yes. and that's because they wanted that sense Peter wanted that sense that it was just continuing on and on and on, that it doesn't stop because there were many more um, concentration camps than this. So Abe Landau survived. Everybody in his family was killed. And he, when they came in and released all the um, prisoners, he, he was doing fairly well actually, given that he was able to be with this doctor. And he immediately took an opportunity to come to America, and he came to New Bedford, um, ultimately, and studied with a tailor. Because he was actually, that was his life's work, he was a tailor. And he did not talk about the Holocaust at all for his entire life. And he and Frida, his wife, Frida, he and she raised, I think it was three beautiful children, and she is also a Holocaust survivor. She lost her whole family too. And they met, um, and I just recently learned this, they met, I believe, here in New Bedford, or he had come here to be a tailor, but somehow New York City, you know, they, come, they came in through New York City and ended up, because they found that New Bedford was an amazingly strong Jewish population. So I live down the street, I live right down West Clinton Street, and I will tell you that this whole neighborhood in the West End, every other house, if not every house, was um, a, a part of the strong Jewish community here. It was unbelievable how strong it was. And they would all walk over to the synagogue, that's why it is where it is. And, um, when Peter was designing this, he wanted this memorial to be here because of the proximity to, to the community. But this is an Olmsted Park, just like Central Park is, yeah. and they had put a, a memorial cap. Uh -huh. There are absolutely to be no more memorials in this park, because they have a bunch, and they're not you know, that personal, and they already had more than Olmsted ever envisioned. So we had to go and get approval to do all this. And, um, you know, Abe would go around and talk about the Holocaust. He was very effective. He was like four feet 11. I'm not kidding. He was just a little tiny man. And he never spoke about the Holocaust until 10 years before this came into fruition. And that's why it says, in honor of Abe Lando whose dream of many years has thus been fulfilled. He started talking because um, Spielberg, when he was doing, what's that movie that uh, Steven Spielberg did? He did um, uh, Schindler's, List. Schindler's List. When he did Schindler's List, uh, Steven Spielberg traveled all around to try to talk to all the survivors he could. And he came to New Bedford and he met with Abe Landau. Yeah, and he asked him all kinds of questions. I was sort of, I saw you guys were coming. I was just trying to, I've started, but I'm. Sorry for the. That's all right. I'm just trying to, um, it's very, very cold. I'm talking about Abe Landau, who is the Holocaust survivor whose idea this whole thing was. And, um, so Steven Spielberg came and he was doing the research for Schindler's List and Abe just started talking about the Holocaust and once he started talking about it, he never stopped talking about it. He just kept going and um, 
it's ironic because once this memorial went up, Abe Lando, within a few months, had a stroke. And he had, at this point, you know, dedicated all of his papers to UMass. You can see them. They're in our rare collection. Um, he has all his papers, all his books. Everything is dedicated to UMass. He was educating people. He got this done. Within months, he had a stroke. And he lost the ability to tell stories. He could talk, but only about in the moment things. So I've always found that so interesting because he went so many years without talking. He talked incessantly for 10 years about nothing but the Holocaust. And as soon as this was realized, it was over. Now Frida, his wife, never talked about the Holocaust. Still has not talked about the Holocaust. In fact, I think she died two years ago, and she, they never spoke about it. It was just too painful for her. So, um, anyway, that's Abe and Frida Landau. And I will tell you, um, their most amazing couple, because they, because they survived this incredible, horrible thing, mm -hmm. they ended up finding each other here in America, and they ended up, you know, having a beautiful family and a relatively normal life. Uh -huh. Um, they were completely devoted to each other, and they were very, very private. So as I'm standing here, and this big middle plinth was coming in, being delivered, and he's talking about all the different concentration camps he had been in. How you doing? Um, he said, and he's standing here, and he looked at his watch, and I mean, the moment his whole realization is happening, and he looked at his watch and he said, Frida has a hair appointment. I've got to go. And he left. And I thought, that is the most amazing priority. Because at the end of the day, it was not about, always for him, not about memorializing what had happened, but honoring what was alive and present in his life in the moment. So for me as a sculptor, I was 28 when I started working on this project, and it's still the most significant project and probably will be my lifetime most significant for me project because I can't believe I, be, I was the sculptor who was able to make I mean that's my hand I mean when I hold the two together I mean it's very obvious to see that it's my hand and um, the thing about Abe is he would tell me you know I promised and I promised and I promised that if I ever got out of the Holocaust and I was able to survive, I would never complain again about anything. And he said, I've never complained about anything in my life. Which was so remarkable to me at 28 years old as an American. I never even thought, I never, you know, we complain all the time. We complain about any, everything, you know? I mean, it's like, it, right, I mean, it's amazing. So anyway. Um, I want to tell you about, so Peter London, he was an art education professor at UMass. He retired shortly after this was finished. This was sort of his culminating moment as well. And Peter designed the overall look of the memorial, and then I made the hand and also worked with my colleague Eric Lintola to select the stone and, you know, create the site and design the site and everything. So um, I want to just have, if you've never read this, this is a really unbelievable um, panel, and it's very hard. Once you read it, it's it's very very difficult to um, sort of take in. So if if you guys can just read it, because um, you know you have to remember, I was 28 years old, right out of grad school. I had not done any public commission work yet, and I remember when Peter London laid this out on the floor of Group 6 to show me. And I remember saying to Peter, um, you know, this is, you know, this is pretty, pretty tough stuff. I mean, this is a memorial, you know, we've raised all this money for it, we've, you know, fought the man to be able to get this put in this park. I mean, do we really, do you really want this? You know? And Peter 
was my mentor when I was first at UMass, and he said to me, Stacy, this happened. There's no reason to water this down. Yes, we want to say it. We want to say it exactly this way. We don't want to water this down. Six million people were slaughtered. And I, that was another huge moment for me, and I think you'll rarely see this. I mean, this was able to happen in New Bedford, you know, in this great city, because we have, we're, have such a strange and eclectic history here anyway. But I think people in New Bedford are sort of okay with this kind of thing. But I, you would never find this in Washington. I don't think in any metropolitan city because things are often done by committee and you know the things done by committee are often watered down quite a bit. So I'm really proud of this. And this is another huge, for me, life lesson um, that I always like to talk to people about because it's just such a such an unusual um, event. I mean, have you ever seen anything quite so graphic, no. Lee said? I mean, it just doesn't happen. Um, so a lot of people talk to me about um, the numbers, and um, I would say that's uh, where I really have a, uh, I have a, I mean, it's a really tough story, but, um, so you see that those are eight Landau's numbers. And so I've always been really taken by the synchronicity of 141282. I just, I don't know why that just always stuck in my mind that it had that kind of looping symbolism to it. And so the, they really wanted to get this done quickly. And memorials don't happen quickly, they take years. We did this entire thing in nine months because wow. they wanted to have it ready for the Holocaust Remembrance, which is in May. They insisted on it. We started in September. So every time, and we met at the Holocaust, the Holocaust Committee met at the synagogue every single week on Wednesday nights. And I had just moved to the area, so these were my first friends. These are the first people I met. And I was really became very, very deeply embedded in the um, in the Jewish culture of New Bedford, and we it was a very elderly group of people. I'll tell you because we're losing survivors. There's probably very I mean there's not that many survivors left because they're just getting older. So we'd meet every week and we talk about the progress and the concepts and the ideas, and we go through things like is it going to be a right hand or a left hand? Is it going to be a a male or a female? Is it going to be this or is it going to be that? And so they wanted the hand to be in some kind of symbolic position. And they started with a, like a menorah, like a candelabra or some kind of shape that would symbolize the menorah. But then they wanted, and I hope you guys really understand what I'm saying, they wanted this memorial to be strong and broken. They wanted it to be male and female. They wanted it to be you know, alive, but completely destroyed. I mean, they wanted it to be every emotion you can imagine. So I started modeling hands, and I would bring in hands, all kinds of hands in every position. They wanted to have symbolic, you know, uh, Judaism, you know, they wanted the symbolism, but they didn't want it to be so symbolic that it would put off Christians. I mean, it was just like they wanted the whole thing. And I would just sit there like, oh, okay, okay, okay. So we finally settled on this, and the reason the gesture is so important is because it is rising, but it's also falling at the same time. And it's strong, but it's, it, it will ultimately survive and prevail, but it's in a moment of recovery. And I remember, and I did not, I will tell you, if you come to the back, I did not achieve, I got this. <laughs> and I swear if I were doing it now, versus 15 years ago, I would have maybe been able to do it a little differently. Um, the back of the hand, if you see some of the hack marks up there, um, he really wanted that to be very rough. Like very, very raw. But I would say that's the only thing I would change at this point. But anyway, let's switch back forward. Back forward. <laughs>
<laughs> now, if you, there is one signature on the back, and I didn't, I chose not to sign it, even though I modeled and made the hand, because I didn't, I didn't think this really was about me. So I, I didn't make that choice. So, I, um, so we're in one of our meetings, and we've settled now on the gesture, and then we had to go through the hump. Who was actually going to make the memorial? And I sort of expected that I was always going to make the memorial since I was doing all the preparatory work. Mm -hmm. But they wanted to have a Jewish sculptor, a sculptor actually do the memorial. And, you know, I said I'd be willing to do it, but then, you know, questions of my own heritage. And I'm German. I mean, my, I'm almost, 50, you know, my father is almost 100% German. And I said, I completely understand why you might not want me to do it, but at the same time, you know, I talked to them just about my empathy. And also, I've always had sort of a, I would say a little bit of a strange sort of preoccupation with the Holocaust. I had a very influential teacher when I was in eighth grade whose grandparents were survivors. And I'd never, how old were you guys when you learned about the Holocaust? Do you remember learning about it? I don't remember. For me, six. it was eighth grade. Yeah. How old were you? Like six. Really? <laughs> My parents didn't understand, don't tell kids things. No, oh, they didn't have that, <laughs> nope. that buffer. So I remember, and it impacted me so much, I couldn't believe it. Um, so anyway, I told him this story, and then Abe Landau said, well, of course Stacy should make the memorial, because she's here with us now. Just, just like what he was saying, so that was interesting. So we go to the and they're Stacy, where are you? Are you done? Are you done? How's the hand? What are you doing? And I finally just had to say, I can't finish it. And they said, what? Ah, what do you mean you cannot finish this? And this is a group of like 20 people, and they met regularly. I mean, this was every week. This nobody missed it. And um, I said, I can't be the tattooer. I, I am German, as you all know, and I just, I don't know. I, I have this hand, I'm done. I, the hand is pretty much complete, but I don't want to reenact that part of history. I don't want to be a Nazi tattooing the hand. This, ins this created a two-hour conversation, like you wouldn't believe. I mean, everybody had a comment about it. Everybody told a story about it. I mean, we went on and on, Peter and every committee member and I'm just sitting there feeling terrible and I said maybe Abe should do it or Rabbi Hartman should do it. I mean we had three rabbis in the room. I was like somebody else. And so just like Abe Landau always did, he raised his hand and said, um, this is after two hours, could I say something? <laughs> we're all like of course you can, you're the whole reason we're here. I mean of course you can say it. So he told us the story of how he got his tattoo. And to the best of my recollection, he says, I was on a train, the French doctor called for me, and I was coming into Auschwitz. And I was on a train with children. And even though we were just children, we were all and very, to very, very young children. He was one of the older at this point very young children, we quickly realized when we got off the train that there were two lines being formed, a line for life and a line for death. And so he had this little boy behind him and the little boy was terrified and he was sobbing and he was, um, oh hey Talitha. No, and, he was sobbing and he was crying and you know, if you act that way in a line with Nazis, they pull you and they blow your head off. So Abe said, you know, don't react. Just act like me. He was much younger than him. Um, I think he said he was six, if my memory serves me correctly. And he's, he said, just act like me and you need to stop crying and you need to be quiet. And so he said that they also realized that the line for life was the tattoo line. So
So if you got that tattoo, he said, I knew I would live till tomorrow, at least. Because though they weren't gonna tattoo kids, they were putting in the ovens. So he said, so, and he looks me right in the face and he says, so Stacy, the tattoo is a symbol of life for me, not of death. And you need to do this. I'm crying. I can't believe it. I'm like, I. But isn't that funny how perception just changes everything? I mean, how from one lens you can view something from a totally different place. So we decided, we went on more conversation, and they decided we were going to make the tattooing of the hand a spiritual event. And we had um, two rabbis. Abe Landau, um, Eric, my colleague in sculpture, Lintola, and Peter London were all there. And as I carved in plaster, the hand was made in plaster, direct plaster, as I carved Abe's tattoo in the hand and just cried and cried and cried, Abe Landau is actually a cantor. Do you know a cantor is the singer yeah. for the synagogue? That's what he does. He sings the prayers. He sang the whole time, and Rabbi Hartman told um, prayer, and I just, I carved the hand. I, I mean, I carved the tattoo. So, I mean, I just think that's a really, you know, in a way, it's just like that phrase where they say, you know, things that break you or things that you fear will make you stronger or whatever that phrase mm -hmm. is. I mean, I think um, anybody that knew Abe Landau understands that, I mean, he really, he led uh, an incredibly peaceful, loving, forward-looking, positive life, mm. despite the fact that he lost everything. Wow. Isn't that amazing? What a story. Well, thank you so much, Stacey. Yeah.